Welcome to Chapel at the Institute of Lutheran Theology. My name is John Sorum. I'm the Dean of Academic Affairs. I will be leading our worship today, bringing you a message from God's Word and leading us in prayer. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our reading for today is from Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Here Paul shows us a life radically different from the life we're used to and as we're used to thinking of. If, if somebody asks you um, uh, who you are, our tendency is to begin to recount what happened to us in the past. Well, I was born here and I was raised here and I've had these experiences and I've lived in these places and so on and so forth. But here Paul tells us to forget our past and look only to the future. This one thing I do, he writes, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. So what's going on here? What Paul means is that we live by hope not by sight. We have heard a promise about our future and we believe that promise and so we live a li lives that are oriented toward that future that is coming. And what is that future? Jesus is risen from the dead. That's the promise. We're going to have a resurrection like his because he has chosen us as his own. But we're not there yet. We aren't yet risen. We are still in this old age, still carrying around the old sinful self within us, still subject to suffering and death. We're waiting for our redemption, but as we're waiting, we're oriented then toward that future that has been promised to us. Suppose that you were in prison, justly condemned for a crime that you are guilty of. And one day you receive a letter from the governor, and he's decided to pardon you. Soon, someone will come and open your cell door and set you free. But for the time being, all you have is a promise. It's signed and sealed by the governor so you can trust it. But you're still in the prison cell. You're still not free. So we have a promise. We are imprisoned and condemned and lost, but we have received news. We are pardoned. And our pardon is signed and sealed by Jesus' death on the cross. But for now, we find ourselves in this body of death, and we still experience the power of sin within us. But forgetting what lies behind, we strain forward to what lies ahead. Or suppose you got a letter in the mail from a lawyer telling you that a long-lost relative had died and left you a fortune. What would your situation be? Well, you're rich, but your riches are only promised. You don't have the money in hand. When you look at your bank statement, you don't see it. If you look at your investment accounts, that money doesn't show up there. It's not there yet, but you believe the promise but you don't have yet have what has been promised to you. So we are heirs of eternal life with Jesus Christ. 
We are rich beyond all thought. The earth and all people and everything is ours and all eternity is ours. A new body, a new life of joy and peace and praise and thanksgiving, a tremendous future awaits us, but we don't see it yet. We look around us, we see sin and death and suffering. We look within and we see the same thing. We haven't yet reached the goal. So forgetting what lies behind, we strain forward to what lies ahead. Or think of a situation in which you have a family member in the military in a war zone. And you have been praying and anxious for months over that person, that loved one. And suddenly, you get the notification that that person is coming home. And in a few days, you're going to go to the airport and meet that person and see that person and hold that person in your arms again. Again, you have a promise. And you hold on to that promise with all your heart. But you don't yet see your loved one. You don't yet have that loved one in your arms. You're still waiting. So we await our beloved. He has won the victory all for us. And we have the promise that he is coming, but we don't see him yet. We cannot yet look at him face to face. We are filled with hope but we don't yet see. So we live by hope. We don't look backwards. We look forward, leaning into a future that is wonderful beyond all imagining. And living in this way is our righteousness. We do nothing and trust for everything. Our righteousness consists in the fact that we trust the promise even though we cannot see. Paul says we do not have a righteousness of our own based on what we do or accomplish. If we trusted in what we do, then we would have to, uh, we wouldn't have to live by hope. We would be looking backward to see what we have done. We could say, oh, look at me. I've been a good father and husband and friend. I've done this and done that, I've gone to church, I've been a, a, a good family, me a community member, etc., etc., etc. But our righteousness is about what God has promised to give us in the future and our trust in that promise. And when we regard God as trustworthy, we are giving Him the greatest possible honor Yes, we don't see that future yet. We don't see the kingdom. We don't see Jesus. In fact, we see the opposite. We see the oppression of Satan, the triumph of death everywhere. We have not reached the goal. Nevertheless, we believe and trust God's word and promise. And when we do that, we give God the highest possible honor, regarding him as totally trustworthy, and so we are righteous before him. We are righteous by believing his promise. We are righteous by believing that future that he has for us. So now I think we can understand what Paul means by forgetting what lies behind. It means that none of the things that seem to count so much in this age can bind us. It means we are the slave of nothing. We are free. Just think of the examples that I mentioned. If you're a prisoner holding in your hands the letter of pardon, what are you thinking of? Are you contemplating the hard walls of your cell, the barren life that you led there, the bitterness of losing your freedom? Isn't your mind focused on this letter and the future it opens up to you? And if you knew that you were an heir to a fortune, would you be dwelling on all of your financial problems in the past? Wouldn't you be anticipating the future and what it will be like? And if you're looking forward to your loved one coming back from war, 
Would you have time for any other thought but your joy and relief in having him or her back? So Paul says when we are focused on that great future God has for us and we know that it is true, then we are set free from the past. We forget what lies behind. The past cannot bind us. When you think about it, we can categorize the past under two headings. Either gifts from God or else sins. Now, if we talk about the gifts from God, those gifts can only be an occasion for thanksgiving. When we look back in the past and see all the blessings that God has given us, and when we give thanks, then we focus on the giver instead of on the gift, and we eagerly await what new gifts God has for us, and especially the great gift of the kingdom. So, thanksgiving for the past only again turns us around and orients us toward the future that is coming. We forget what lies behind, and we look ahead to that great future that is to come. And as for our past sins, they are covered up by forgiveness. Christ has put them to death on the cross so we can forget about them. And again, the only thing that can uh, arise in our hearts it is thanksgiving for his wonderful grace, which again turns us around to the future to anticipate with mounting hope that great event that is coming. So forgetting what lies behind, we are free from the past. These two things, sin, the forgiveness of sin and thanksgiving uh, for blessings, snap the tie that binds us to the past so we can forget what lies behind us and strain forward with everything in us toward the future that God promises. We press on toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, we keep our focus on Jesus who's at the right hand of God, has all things under him, and as we look ahead, uh, we, we look ahead to the time when we will receive that upward call to reign with him and to be part of his joy forever. Jesus once said that anyone who sets his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. The way to plow with an old-fashioned plow pulled by an ox was to keep your sight fixed on where you were going. If you look back, your furrow would be crooked. I've done a little bit of sailing and I know the same thing applies there. At least when you're in sight of land, you can keep your course only by focusing on a landmark that you're pointing your boat toward. So also we strain forward. We press on toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. We forget the past and set our eyes on the future, and we live by the energy of that future that is set before us by the power of the resurrection. We are energized, we are filled with God's own energy, God's own power, we are filled with His Spirit as His Spirit carries us forward into that future which is ours by His Word. Jesus gave us the pledge and seal of that future, a foretaste of that future in the Holy Supper. Jesus gives Himself to us there as He promised. And as we eat and drink, we are already part of that future. As surely as we eat and drink, so surely will the prison door be opened and we will be free. As surely as we eat and drink, so surely will we receive Jesus' inheritance as ours, resurrection, life, joy, forever. As surely as we eat and drink, so surely will we see Jesus with our own eyes and find ourselves in his arms, never to be separated from him. So forget what lies behind. 
Strain forward to what lies ahead. Press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for the church, for the world, and our poor sinful selves. Let us pray to the Lord who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord Jesus, when we contemplate your self-sacrificing love for us, we can repeat the, two, the words of two beloved hymns, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a tribute far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Thousand, thousand thanks are due, dearest Jesus, unto you. Lord, in your mercy, we are prepared. Grant that your church would count everything as lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing you as Savior, Lord, and God. Fill it with overwhelming desire to make you known to every sinner throughout the world until you truly are the all in all, for all. Especially we pray for the persecuted church, for missionaries and evangelists throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give peace, justice, health, and safety to every nation, especially our own. Grant wisdom and integrity to all who have been entrusted with authority and power, especially our elected and appointed leaders. Teach us to love one another through deeds of mercy and words of understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There are so many people who hunger for healing and thirst for reconciliation, who long for encouragement and seek understanding, who desire forgiveness, comfort, faith, and hope. Refresh them in the wilderness of their suffering, dear Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In gratitude and hope, we entrust our beloved dead into your keeping, dear Lord. Bestow the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, upon us all, especially upon all who mourn. Through the same Spirit's power and gifts, grant that throughout our life we may know you, O Christ, and the power of your resurrection. Give us grace to share in your suffering. Claim us as your own. Clothe us with your righteousness and of your mercy. Welcome us and all whom you have redeemed into your Father's everlasting kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us, dear Lord, and answer our prayers according to your will, to your glory and for the benefit of the people you long to save. Amen. Our Father, who art Amen. in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.